I'm Helen, and I married Tom five years ago because I believed we had similar goals and aspirations. We moved into my opulent apartment on the top level of a skyscraper, which had an amazing view every time I peered out the window. My career was on a fast track, and I was the head of the finance department of a trading business. Linda, Tom's mother, lived close by and frequently came to see us. She was obvious from the start that she disapproved of my career-focused way of living. She would reply, her lips pursed in disdain. A woman's place is in the home. Rather than gallivanting off to work every day, you should be taking care of your husband. When Linda went on her tirades about the responsibilities of a good wife, I attempted to preserve the peace by smiling and nodding. But on the inside, I was furious. From the beginning, I had been quite clear to Tom that I intended to develop my profession before getting married and starting a family. I could see him hesitating over time due to his mother's influence, even if he had consented at the moment. I got home one evening from a particularly demanding workday to find Tom and Linda seated at our dining table, talking with their heads pressed together. As soon as I entered, they stopped talking and I got a shiver. We need to talk, Helen, Tom remarked in a tense voice. With my heart racing, I set my suitcase down and sat down. What's the matter? Linda was the first to speak. First of all, we are concerned about you, Helen, my love. All of this labor is unhealthy. Your husband and your house are being neglected. When will you begin to consider being a parent? I inhaled deeply while attempting to control my fury. Tom, Linda, and I have talked about this. We decided to prioritize our jobs before considering establishing a family. Tom moved in his chair uneasily. Perhaps it's time to change your mind, Helen. Mom is right. We're not growing any younger. I'm sick of ordering takeout every night, and the flat is a complete mess. What I was hearing was unbelievable. Are you serious, Tom? We discussed this. You are aware of how much I value my work. More significant than your kin. Linda cut in, her tone piercing. With a loud scrape of my chair on the floor, I got up. I'm creating a future for our family via my work. I assumed you were aware of it. Tom, I locked myself in our bedroom and stormed out of the room. I couldn't get rid of the sensation that this was only the beginning of my problems as I laid on the bed and stared at the ceiling. I had no idea how correct I was. Before Tom woke up the following morning, I departed for work. I promised myself as I took the elevator down to the lobby that I would not let anyone, not even my spouse, to stop me from achieving my goals. I wasn't going to give it all up now since I had put in too much effort to get here. I was determined to prove myself, so I got to work earlier than normal and remained late. My efforts were not in vain. My secretary buzzed me a couple of hours later. The president wants to see you in his office, Mrs. Thompson. I walked to the top level, my heart pounding. Our company's president, Mr. Johnson, was well known for his financial savvy, and propensity to surprise his staff. When I knocked on his door, he answered, come in, Helen, take a seat. With my hands firmly gripped in my lap, I sat on the edge of the leather chair across from his desk. I've been keeping a close eye on your work, Mr. Johnson said, his countenance inscrutable. I have to admit, I'm impressed. I released a breath that I had been suppressing without realizing it. Thank you, sir. His eyes were piercing as he leaned forward. We're growing Helen, joining forces with a big business from another city. We need the finest individuals on board for this significant transition. My heartbeat accelerated. Was this heading in the direction I had assumed? He went on to say, I intend to elevate you to the position of head of a new department. Helen, I won't lie to you, though. It will be difficult. You'll need to put in more effort than you've ever done. Are you game? I considered what Linda and Tom would want from me. 
I then reflected on the many late hours I had spent studying financial reports and the joy I had when a project was completed flawlessly. Yes, sir, I firmly replied. I agree. I will not disappoint you. I felt as though I was walking on air as I walked out of Mr. Johnson's office. I had spent all these years striving for this. I was eager to inform Tom of the news. When he witnessed my increasing success, he would undoubtedly comprehend the significance of my career. I ordered all of Tom's favorite meals when I stopped at our favorite restaurant on my way home. I picked up a bunch of flowers and a bottle of champagne. There was reason to celebrate, and I was going to make it extra spectacular. I juggled the bags as I unlocked our apartment door. Tom. I called out, I'm home, and I've got a surprise. I found him in the living room, sprawled on the couch, the TV blaring. He barely looked up as I entered. Tom, you won't believe what happened today. I said, my excitement bubbling over. I'm getting promoted, head of a new department. Isn't that amazing? Tom muted the TV and turned to face me, his expression far from the joy I'd expected. So you'll be working even more now, is that it? I felt my smile falter. Well, yes, but think about what this means for us. We'll be able to afford that big house we've always talked about, regular trips around the world. Our future is set. Tom stood up abruptly. Our future? What future, Helen? You're never home as it is. When was the last time we had dinner together? When was the last time we even had a real conversation? I gestured helplessly at the bags I'd brought home. That's why I brought dinner. I thought we could celebrate. Celebrate what? Tom's voice rose. Celebrate you abandoning our marriage for your job. Celebrate the fact that I married a woman who cares more about her career than having a family. I felt tears pricking at my eyes. I thought you'd be happy for me, I whispered. Tom's face softened for a moment, then hardened again. I can't do this anymore, Helen. Something has to change. With that, he stormed off to his office, slamming the door behind him. I stood in the middle of our living room, surrounded by the trappings of the celebration that would never happen, feeling more alone than I ever had in my life. As I mechanically put away the food and poured myself a glass of champagne, I couldn't help but wonder, was this the price of success? And if it was, was I willing to pay it? One evening, as I was leaving the office, I had an idea. I'd hire a housekeeper, someone to clean the apartment and cook meals. It would solve Tom's complaints about the messy apartment and lack of home-cooked food. Satisfied with my solution, I made the necessary arrangements. Two weeks later, I came home to find the apartment spotless, the air filled with the aroma of a home-cooked meal. I smiled to myself, certain that Tom would be pleased. I heard the front door open and close. Tom, I called out. I'm home and dinner's ready. He walked into the kitchen, his eyes darting around the clean space. What's all this? I hired a housekeeper, I explained unable to keep the pride out of my voice. She cleans and cooks. I thought it would make things easier for both of us. Instead of the gratitude I expected, Tom's face clouded over. So this is your solution. Hire someone else to do your job. That's not fair, I protested. I'm trying to find a balance. Balance, Tom laughed bitterly. Is that what you call this? Tell me, Helen, now that you found a replacement for yourself in the kitchen, are you going to find a replacement for yourself in our bed, too? I recoiled as if he'd slapped me. How dare you? I hissed. I've done nothing but try to make our life better, and this is how you react. Tom turned away. I'm going out. Don't wait up. The door slammed behind him, leaving me alone in the immaculate kitchen the untouched dinner growing cold on the table. Over the next few days, Tom and I barely spoke. I buried myself in work, 
focusing on the upcoming merger. It was easier to deal with spreadsheets and financial projections than the mess my personal life had become. Then one rare Saturday when I didn't have to go into the office, I decided to make an effort. I spent the morning cooking Tom's favorite meals, set the table with our best china, and even put on the dress he bought me for our last anniversary. When Tom came home, I was waiting with a smile. I thought we could have a nice dinner together, I said, trying to keep my voice light. Just the two of us. Tom looked at me for a long moment, then nodded silently. My heart leaped. Maybe this was the turning point we needed. I was just about to serve the appetizer when the doorbell rang. Confused, I went to answer it. There, standing in the hallway, was Linda. Linda, I said, unable to keep the surprise out of my voice. We weren't expecting you. Oh, I was in the neighborhood and thought I'd drop by, she said, pushing past me into the apartment. Tom, darling, there you are. I watched in dismay as my carefully planned romantic dinner turned into an impromptu family gathering. Linda dominated the conversation, peppering her small talk with not-so-subtle digs at my housekeeping and lack of maternal instincts. You know, she said, helping herself to more wine. In my day, a woman knew her place was in the home. We took pride in taking care of our husbands and raising our children. I stood up abruptly. I think it's time for dessert, I said, fleeing to the kitchen. As I leaned against the counter, trying to regain my composure, I could hear Linda's voice drifting in from the dining room. Tom, darling, you need to talk some sense into her. A woman's duty is to her family first. Everything else is secondary. I closed my eyes, fighting back tears. This wasn't how I had imagined my life would be. I had a successful career, a beautiful home, but at what cost? As I listened to Linda's continued lecture on the virtues of traditional family values, I couldn't help but wonder if I had made a terrible mistake somewhere along the way. One evening, I came home later than usual, my mind still buzzing from the day's meetings. As I opened the door to our apartment, I froze. There scattered across the living room floor were baby clothes, tiny onesies, miniature socks, even a small pair of shoes. Tom, I called out, my voice wavering. What's all this? He emerged from the bedroom, a strange look on his face. A mom brought those over. She thought it might help you get in the mood. I picked up a small t-shirt, my fingers trembling. In the mood for what, exactly? For starting a family, of course, Tom said, as if it were the most obvious thing in the world. Helen, we're not getting any younger. It's time we seriously considered having children. I spent the rest of the evening silently putting away the baby clothes, my mind in turmoil. Was I being selfish? Was my ambition destroying my marriage? The next morning, I woke up to find more baby items strategically placed around the apartment. A rattle on the coffee table, a baby book on my nightstand, a high chair in the kitchen. Linda's handiwork, no doubt. I tried to ignore them, but they seemed to multiply every day. There was something new. It was as if the apartment was slowly transforming into a nursery, whether I wanted it to or not. One night, I came home to find Linda sitting on our couch, flipping through a parenting magazine. Linda, I said, unable to keep the irritation out of my voice. I didn't know you were coming over. She looked up, a saccharine smile on her face. Oh, Helen, dear, I hope you don't mind. Tom said I could wait for him here. He's just popped out to get some groceries. I nodded stiffly, heading to the bedroom to change. When I came back out, Linda was standing by the window, looking out at the city skyline. You know, Helen, she said, not turning around. A view like this is wasted on just two people. Imagine how lovely it would be to have a child toddle up to this window, their little hands pressed against the glass, eyes wide with wonder. I felt a headache coming on. 
Linda, I appreciate your concern, but Tom and I will decide when we're ready for children. She turned to face me, her eyes hard. And when will that be, Helen? Well, you've worked yourself into an early grave. What, it's too late? I opened my mouth to argue, but at that moment, Tom walked in, arms full of grocery bags. He looked between us, sensing the tension. Everything okay here? He asked cautiously. Linda's demeanor changed instantly. Oh, everything's fine, darling. I was just having a little chat with Helen about family planning. Tom's eyes lit up. Really? That's great. I knew you'd come around, Helen. I felt cornered, outnumbered. I, I need some air, I mumbled, grabbing my coat and rushing out of the apartment. A few weeks later, I stumbled through the front door, exhausted from another long day at work. The sight that greeted me stopped me in my tracks. There padding around our living room in fluffy pink pajamas was Linda. What's going on here? I demanded, my voice rising with each word. Tom emerged from the kitchen, a defiant look on his face. I decided that Mom is going to live with us. You're always at work, always away from home. I'm tired of being alone. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. You decided without even discussing it with me. When are you ever here to discuss anything? Tom shot back. I turned to Linda, who was watching our exchange with a smug smile. You can't stay here. This is my home. Tom's face darkened. If you're not happy with this arrangement, you can get out. I felt like I'd been slapped. Excuse me. I bought this apartment before we even got married. It's registered in my name. You can't kick me out of my own home. Linda stood up, her face twisted with anger. She took a threatening step towards me. Now listen here, you ungrateful. I held up a hand, stopping her in her tracks. Don't come any closer, Linda. If you lay a hand on me, I'll call the police. Linda's face crumpled. She collapsed onto the sofa, clutching her chest dramatically. Oh, Tom, she wailed. Did you hear that? She threatened to call the police on me. Your own wife threatening your mother. Oh, how she's hardened. That awful job of hers has turned her into a monster. Tom rushed to his mother's side, shooting me a venomous look. How could you, Helen? Your own mother-in-law. I couldn't take it anymore. Without another word, I stormed off to the guest bedroom, locking the door behind me. I spend a restless night tossing and turning, my mind racing with the absurdity of the situation. The next morning, I was awakened by my phone ringing. It was Mr. Johnson, my boss. Helen, I need you on a plane today, he said without preamble. We're ready to move forward with the merger. I need you in Chicago ASAP. I've never packed so quickly in my life. As I wheeled my suitcase to the front door, I was met with the stony faces of Tom and Linda. I have to go on a business trip, I said, my voice cold. It's for the merger. I'll be back soon. Tom's lip curled. Don't bother coming back at all. The flight to Chicago was a blur. I threw myself into work, grateful for the distraction. The merger negotiations were intense, requiring all of my focus and energy. But in the quiet moments when I was alone in my hotel room, the reality of my situation came crashing down. After a grueling week of negotiations and sleepless nights, I finally returned home. As I stood outside my apartment door, suitcases at my feet, I felt a mix of exhaustion and anticipation. I just wanted to collapse into my own bed and forget about the world for a while. I inserted my key into the lock, but it wouldn't turn. Frowning, I tried again. Nothing. A cold feeling of dread washed over me as I realized what must have happened. I knocked on the door, my heart pounding. After a moment, it swung open. There stood Tom and Linda, both wearing casual house clothes, looking at me with a mixture of smugness and disdain. Why doesn't my key work? 
I asked, my voice barely above a whisper. Tom let out a harsh laugh. I changed the locks, he said, his eyes glinting with malice. You can come in if you're ready to choose your family over your precious career. I stood there, stunned. What are you talking about? Tom reached into his pocket and pulled out a stack of papers. With a flourish, he presented them to me. Divorce papers, he said. It's time to choose, Helen, your career or your home. What's it going to be? I looked at Tom, really looked at him. And in that moment, I realized something profound. I didn't love him anymore. The man I had married was gone, replaced by this bitter, manipulative stranger. Linda's shrill voice cut through my thoughts. Well, we're waiting. Make your choice. I took a deep breath, straightening my spine. I choose my career, I said, my voice steady, because I don't have a family or a husband, not anymore. Tom's face twisted with anger, but he thrust a pen at me. With a steady hand, I signed the divorce papers right there in the hallway. As soon as I finished, Linda grabbed my arm and roughly pushed me toward the elevator. Good riddance, she spat, slamming the door behind me. I stood there, staring at the closed door of what used to be my home. A laugh bubbled up from my chest, bordering on hysterical. I had just been kicked out of my own apartment, the one I had bought with my hard-earned money. Too tired to make a scene, I gathered my suitcases and made my way to a nearby hotel. A few hours later, I received a call from my friend Rachel, a realtor I had worked with when buying the apartment. Helen Han, how are you doing? Rachel asked, concern evident in her voice. I've been better, I admitted. Why do you ask? Rachel hesitated. I've seen Tom's posts on social media. He's, well, he's saying some pretty nasty things about you. My stomach dropped. What kind, kind of things? He's calling you a soulless careerist who destroyed your family for the sake of your job, she said. He says he sacrificed everything for your relationship, and you just used him and tossed him aside. He's even talking about suing you for a lemony. People are really sympathizing with him, Helen. I felt a surge of anger. That's not what happened at all. I didn't think so, Rachel said. Want to tell me your side? I gave her a brief rundown of the events of the past week. When I finished, Rachel was quiet for a moment. Oh, Helen, she finally said. I'm so sorry you're going through this. Listen, I'm going to set the record straight with our friends and colleagues. People need to know the truth. Thanks, Rachel, I said, feeling a lump in my throat. I really appreciate that. As I hung up the phone, I felt a mix of emotions. Anger at Tom's lies, gratitude for Rachel's support, and a growing determination. Tom might have taken my home for now, but I wasn't going to let him take my reputation or my dignity. The vibration of my phone startled me out of my thoughts. Mr. Johnson's name flashed on the screen, and my stomach dropped. I took a deep breath and answered. Helen, we need to talk, Mr. Johnson said, his voice uncharacteristically serious. I've heard some concerning things on social media. I closed my eyes, bracing for the worst. Sir, I can explain. Dash, no need to explain, Helen, he interrupted. I want to hear your side of the story. Relief washed over me. I took a deep breath and launched into the whole sordid tale. The arguments, Linda moving in, being locked out of my own apartment, and Tom's social media smear campaign. When I finished, there was a long pause on the other end of the line. Then to my surprise, Mr. Johnson chuckled. Helen, do you really think I believe that nonsense your ex is spouting? He said, I know you. I've seen your dedication, your work ethic. Don't let this affect your confidence. You have every right to defend yourself, and I want you to know that the company stands behind you. Tears of relief pricked at my eyes. Thank you, sir. 
You don't know how much that means to me. A couple of days later, my phone pinged with a social media notification. Tom was doing a live broadcast from my apartment. Curious, I tapped on the video. There was Tom, grinning at the camera, surrounded by a film crew. Hey everyone, exciting news. We're about to start a major renovation on our apartment. The crew from Extreme Makeover, Home Edition, will be here in two weeks to transform this place. I stared at the screen, a plan forming in my mind. Instead of anger, I felt a sense of calm determination. I picked up my phone and dialed Rachel's number. It's Helen. I need a huge favor, I said the moment she answered. I need you to sell my apartment, fast, like within two weeks fast. Rachel let out a low whistle. That's a tall order, Helen. What's the rush? I quickly explained about Tom's renovation plans. I need new owners in there before that film crew arrives. But Helen, how am I supposed to show the apartment? Tom changed the locks, remember? I sent her the most recent photos I had of the place. These will have to do. I know it's not ideal. Rachel cut me off with a laugh. Oh, honey, you underestimate me. I've got a couple who've been looking for exactly this kind of place in this area. They trust my judgment. With these photos and the reputation of the building, I think I can make this happen. Two weeks flew by in a blur of work and anticipation. Before I knew it, the day of the big renovation reveal had arrived. I sat in my hotel room, laptop open, watching the live stream with bated breath. The camera panned across my former apartment, now filled with an excited film crew and construction workers. Tom and Linda stood in the center, beaming at the cameras. We're so excited to start this renovation, Tom was saying, his arm around Linda's shoulders. It's time for a fresh start, a new chapter in our lives. Just as the host was about to give the signal to start demolition, there was a commotion off camera. The door burst open, and in walked a smartly dressed couple, followed by a familiar face, Rachel. I'm sorry, but you can't renovate this apartment, the man said, holding up a stack of papers. It belongs to us now. The camera swung wildly as confusion erupted. Tom's face went from shock to anger. What are you talking about? This is my home. Rachel stepped forward, her voice calm but firm. Actually, Tom, this apartment belonged to your ex-wife, Helen. She sold it to this lovely couple two weeks ago. Your signature on the renovation documents is a forgery. The host of the show turned to Tom, his face livid. You forged documents? Do you have any idea how much trouble you've caused? As the MC proceeded to chastise them live on TV, Tom and Linda's cheeks flushed deeply. Millions of people saw the controversy play out in real time as Tom's falsehoods fell apart around him. I couldn't help but chuckle, experiencing a mixture of comfort and validation. It was done. I was victorious. I took a risk with the money I got from selling the flat. I purchased a quaint small home in the city where our business had recently merged. Somehow, a new house in the city where my work was flourishing felt poetic. I was thrilled when Mr. Johnson named me the leader of our recently acquired business. Although it was a struggle, I was more than prepared for it. A few weeks later, I was in front of Tom once more, this time in a courtroom. He dared to ask for a lemony, in addition to half of the money from the sale of the flat. I was pleased to see the judge reject his allegations, pointing to the falsified paperwork and his attempt to illegally take my property. Tom came up to me as we were leaving the courthouse, his former bluster giving way to desperation. Helen, please, he pleaded with. I apologize for all of this. Can't we begin again? Give our marriage another chance. When I actually looked at him, I felt nothing at all. No grief or rage, just a deep feeling of liberation. I laughed finally, but not in a mean way. I responded, no, Tom, and shook my head. 
we are unable to begin over. However, I can start over, and I'm doing just that. I felt lighter than I have in years as I turned to go. My career was taking off. I was in charge of a successful merger and was well-liked by both superiors and peers. I had moved into a lovely new house that was really mine.